A technology We, the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, ISHRI, stand tall in the Indian industry with over 10,000 professionals as members and almost an equal number of student members. Founded in 1981 and headquartered in Delhi, we operate from chapters and sub-chapters spread all over India bringing our entire industry together. Individuals become members of our society according to their professional and academic standings. Our roadmap of the future looks very bright with thousands of new members joining this technical society every year and bringing in a fresh outlook to our industry intelligence. ISHRE disseminates knowledge through its technical committees which consists of some of the best minds of our industry. It publishes technical books, newsletters and a prestigious journal distributing the wealth of knowledge to all its members. Working with government departments, ISHRE helps formalize industry codes and standards. ISHRE promotes research by offering financial support to student members to carry out groundbreaking work in technology, systems and processes. Our educational wing, ISHRE Institute of Excellence, organizes training programs and workshops to help members enhance their skill sets. Our specially designed certification programs under ICP, that is ISHRE Certified Professional, empower professionals to always be in step with the prevailing technology. Specially designed courses for technicians are offered to meet the ever-increasing demand for a skilled workforce. ISHRE organizes exhibitions, conferences, panel discussions and product presentations throughout the country. We organize the industry's largest international exposition in South Asia, Acrex India to showcase the cutting-edge technology, innovation and provide a platform for closer interactions amongst the decision-makers in the industry. The Acrex exhibition is now growing from HVAC and R show into BFA, Build Fair Alliance. This brings together several allied shows connected with the building services industry all at one location. Our chapters organize several other popular events like AcriConf in Delhi, Raycon in Kolkata, Symposia in Mumbai, TechFest in Goa and many more. We are committed to provide training and career guidance to our student members through seminars, lectures, quiz contests and site visits. AQuest, a prestigious quiz competition organized by ISHRE to catalyze the transformation of the budding engineering professionals. ISHRE provides a platform to potential employers to select student members for careers in HVAC and our industry at the ISHRE job junction. Young minds are made aware of the need for saving power, clean air, and sustainability. The K-12 initiative of ISHRE focuses attention on school students' development to inculcate a scientific fervor and help develop them into responsible citizens. Speedy information is imperative to keep moving forward in this hyper-connected digital age. Searcher.
a specifically designed search engine is now available which allows access to a well catalogued database on HVACR and building services industry with just a few clicks. Ishre cooperates with various national and international bodies, industry, governments, academia, think tanks to promote the concept of sustainability, environmental protection and energy efficiency and conservation. To enter and explore the universe of the Indian HVACR industry, log on to ishray.in that unfolds a panorama of information. Let us engineer a sustainable future together through ishray. Our world is changing. Cities are growing. Food is moving faster, further. And we want healthier, more comfortable lives. These changes are driving up the demand for energy. So who's enabling more energy efficient homes, cities and industries? Armacell. We understand the world's energy demands and engineer solutions that make a difference. Solutions that help save energy lower costs, and reduce emissions. As a global leader in equipment insulation, we are tackling the energy challenge, since the smallest things have the biggest impact. We manufacture equipment insulation, engineered foams and aerogel blankets, helping homes to optimize energy efficiency in solar applications, skyscrapers to reduce energy losses in air conditioning and water piping, trains to provide fire-safe insulation, onshore pipelines to prevent corrosion under insulation, and wind turbines to make renewable energy production possible. We invest in new technologies, focus on superior product performance, and constantly innovate thinner, lighter and more environmentally friendly products so we can help cities meet the needs of energy distribution and enhance living comfort through thermal and acoustic insulation. Our vision is shared by 3,000 employees around the world who make Armacell a trusted and reliable partner and support our customers in more than 100 countries where every individual has a passion to make a difference in our mission to enable a more energy efficient world. Discover how at Armacell.com A technology leader offering total fluid dynamics and handling solutions. KSB attributes the highest importance to optimal quality and customer care. Because for us, the customer is our world. KSB is that name that has been taming fluids for about a century and a half. With their long perfected solutions for every industry and for customers that need them. Established in 1871 in Germany,
Today, the group has over 90 companies, employing over 16,000 employees, and with a turnover of over 2.3 billion euros, and is one of the leaders in this field worldwide. Heir to this lofty tradition of technological leadership, KSP came into existence in India in 1960 with its first factory in Pimpri in Pune. Today, KSB in India manufactures and offers an illustrious star cast of pumps, valves and a tight array of services from five ultra-modern factories across India, fulfilling the needs of a diverse and knowledgeable domestic and international customer base. And now, to cater to the growing demands of the energy sector, KSB is poised to set up yet another state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Shirwal near Pune. So whether it is submersible pumps or pumps for nuclear reactors, several innovative solutions have made their debut on the shop floors of KSB in India with the objective of offering best suited solutions to our customers' needs and with the intention to be ahead of time all the time. When customers describe their needs, we listen intently. Sometimes it may mean a standard pump or a valve, and sometimes a whole tailor-made solution. We have set for ourselves high standards, often as high as the highest building for transporting water, fresh water, hot water, and even water for firefighting, to a host of offices, airports, and industrial complexes. In the power sector, we help to produce more power with less fuel and ensure cost effectiveness in the most critical conditions. And that's why our excellence is energy in constant motion. In the petrochemical and refinery sector, our pumps and valves perform with choreographed finesse in handling hazardous and cryogenic liquids. Our products handle extreme pressures and temperatures effortlessly. Whether it is for handling water or aggressive and corrosive fluids or viscous and solid laden fluids in industrial processes. KSB pumps have been relentlessly working in the agriculture and irrigation sectors for decades reliably supplying water to farms and fields across the length and breadth of the country. Even when it comes to pumping with non-conventional energy sources in rural India, we romance the life-giving element, water, with great panache. When it comes to handling wastewater and effluents, our products perform responsibly and with grace. Your wish to expect the best from us inspires us to keep innovating and offer the best to you. KSB, our technology, your success, and that's a promise. Thank you everyone for uh, joining this session. So, uh, before going to the session, uh, I have one PPT with our board partner. So, we'll go through, then we'll go to the session. So, uh, LPR of Lex is our world partner and uh, they are into basically innovation, sol insulation solution. You can see the portfolio, they have over 10,000 products founded in 1985. Uh, turnover is USD 160 million and 11 companies spread across the globe. Few more details about the LPR of Lex. They have done projects in airport, hospital, IT sector, industries, government, educational institution, prestigious international projects they have. Key certification you can see over there. Base product line you can see they have Aeroflex, Aerocells, Flex Eco. And these are the contracts that we're over here in this PPT. 
you can contact our uh, this number or you can mail to the marketing at lprflex.com for further any query so thank you very much for being with us as we know that today we are going to cover the topic low energy cooling using radiant structure and lake bound loop cooling of course uh, this program is being organized by delhi chapter of isre and uh, without the help of our annual partners like platinum annual partner armacel gold annual partner lpro flex ksb silver partner briar dri syscam advance wall and marvex and annual partner andris hydro paramount polytrade kflex and membership partner standard revision they have supported uh, uh, they are being, they are supporting us for all the programs and activities for all year so we are thankful for them yes uh, we are grateful to the speaker for the day uh, mr madhusudan rapol and we are fortunate enough that that uh, they have taken out the time for uh, their pg schedule uh, for this program few lines i would like to uh, say about uh, uh, mr padusudan uh, he uh, he is the founder and md of urja energy his expertise is in clean tech heating cooling and ventilation solution he has four uh, patents filed in this field he is a pioneer in introducing many new technology at new commercial scale in india this technology includes radiant cooling geothermal cooling solar and waste heat based cooling he has been at the uh, forefront of uh, promoting low energy and healthy building in india he holds a bachelor in mechanical engineers and has professional degrees from terry university and stanford graduate student of uh, school of business he is currently the chair of technical group of radiant cooling in isre and is actively involved in various research and development activities in the space in india as well so on behalf of all the members delegates present over here and uh, cwc members of delhi chapter of isre i would like to welcome here sir with you uh, madhusudan rao sir please uh, now it's forum all yours so thank you very much sir and we have great opportunity to learn from him so uh, take out the best of your time that you are going to uh, invest here in this program thank you very much over to you sir thank you thank you for inviting me onto the forum and uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, good evening to everyone who has uh, joined for this program uh, let me start uh, with sharing uh, my screen so i'm going to talk about uh, three related technologies today radiant cooling which many of you may be aware but i'll still uh, present about that some of you may not be fully aware or may have questions that may be unanswered so i'll still cover that but after that i will uh, dive into two relatively unknown topics but something that uh, have great potential to significantly reduce energy consumption for cooling so those are uh, structure cooling and uh, lake slash pond loop cooling these are relatively unknown so i'll try to see uh, i cover most of the uh, time in that and maybe towards the end uh, we can have question and answer session uh, what i would also encourage because this is a uh, maybe a relatively longer session um we will divide the q and a into three parts so you can continue to add questions whenever you get in the q and a box that you see on your screen right uh may i'll pause once i finish radiant cooling uh and take up questions that may have come up in that part then i'll pause again at uh, structure cooling uh take few questions which are there and then in the end for lake or pond loop cooling that way it doesn't become uh too cumbersome in the end and uh, we will address whatever our questions concerns queries which may come up uh, for each segment there 
So I just wanted to confirm on the time. Um, so we are at 4.23. Uh, what, what is the time? I mean, how long do we expect uh, this to be there? Uh, just a sense so that I can pace myself accordingly. So we have till about one and a half hours, I guess, right? At least. Uh, you have uh, more than enough time, sir. I think you okay. can go to the 6.30 as well. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. So let me first start with uh, the radiant cooling part. Uh, before that, of course, disclaimer uh, that whatever I say here is only my here is only attributable, attributable to me, not to Ishray. So that way. So with that, let's uh, start with radiant cooling. And before we get into how it works, what it does, I just wanted to take all of us back to uh, maybe uh, middle school or high school way where we learned about heat transfer. There are only three ways for that heat transfer. Um, this is what we learned in high school. But most of the heat transfer in HVAC industry in air conditioning, and by definition, when we say air conditioning, is done through convection primarily. So the other two modes of uh, heat transfer are not very well understood in the industry. So we, but we do have to understand that uh, the heat transfer, to me, cooling is a process of taking the heat away, right? I mean, whether it is by conduction, convection, or radiation. So as long as you are taking away the heat from a space, we would call it cooling. And apart from convection, we have radiation and conduction to do the same. And in the principle for radiation is a body at a higher temperature will radiate to a surface at a lower temperature. So heat, remember heat always flows from hot to cold. One of the biggest misconception people have is heat will flow from bottom to top just because hot air flows. Hot air goes from bottom to top. That is because of it's difference in density, but heat will always flow from hot to cold, whether it is top to bottom, bottom to top or sideways, whichever way, right? So we have to keep this in mind well, while trying to understand how radiant cooling works. Um, other, another lesson in bit of human evolution, uh, if you see fans and all are relatively recent innovations and humans, the way they have kept themselves cooler before the advent of fans and everything was to primarily use their body. Our body is also uh, like an like a engine which radiates heat, right? We increase the surface area of an engine to increase its heat transfer so that it can reject the heat that it generates. So our metabolism also generates heat and that is why we have a certain value in the heat load where uh, you know each occupant has a certain sensible load. So this heat uh, is primarily radiated out of the body. So in the past, uh, we used to build buildings with uh, you know thick walls, three feet, four feet, in some cases, even six feet. The primary reason, one of the reasons was so that the inner walls never become hot enough to exceed the temperature of the body. So just, just now you have heard what is the definition of radiant heat transfer, right? In a radiant heat transfer, as long as the surface temperature of the walls is lower than the body surface temperature, the body will radiate heat to those surfaces. And that is why if you see the older buildings, all of them had a lot of thermal mass so that the heat, the inner walls didn't get heated up. But once we had fans and advent of air conditioning, that need was not needed. So the wall thicknesses started coming down and we are down to just 
structural gazing of maybe 10 mm now. Okay. So, <clears throat> so apart from uh, the human, uh, I mean, in talking more about human comfort, you're all aware that there are multiple things which impact uh, human comfort. Uh, we tend to focus more on the air, the dry bulb temperature in the space, uh, to some extent, of course, the humidity. But one thing uh, that we need to underline or understand better is something called mean radiant temperature. Now, mean radiant temperature links back to what I just said about the temperature of the surfaces in the space. So if you really imagine, if we are inside a space, we are not directly exposed to the sun. Therefore, we are not directly exposed to the solar radiation that all of you take into account in your heat load calculations, nor are we exposed to the ambient temperature. We are only exposed to six surfaces, four walls, ceiling, and floor. So whatever may be the temperature outside, whatever may be the solar radiation, everything translates to into what are the wall temperatures inside because those are the walls that radiate heat to us. And all of you who are in Delhi experience this very well in summer, right? You walk into your home in the evening, you feel you have walked into an oven because the walls, the floor, the ceiling of the house are radiating heat to you even after sundown because it has accumulated. I'll show you some thermographs later in the presentation. So, if we can lower the mean radiant temperature, then we can lower, we can improve the human comfort. And I'll just go a little more deeper into this. Maybe the slide is not clear, but I'll try to explain what this is. You see, all our, <coughs> all our um, ISHRAE documentation also, ASHRAE documentation also talks about primarily operative temperature. And many times we do the mistake of equating operative temperature to the dry bulb temperature. But operative temperature is actually a function of dry bulb temperature and the mean radiant temperature. We can approximate it to an average of mean radiant temperature and dry bulb temperature. What is the mean radiant temperature? It is a weighted average temperature of the surfaces that we are exposed to. So in very simple terms, it would be the four wall ceiling and the floor the surface areas and their temperatures multiplied by total surface area, right? So you get that. So an operative temperature, if you see here, let me see if I can have pointer. Yep. So if you see here, one can have an operative temperature of 20 degrees with a dry bulb temperature of 18 degrees centigrade with a main, main uh, sorry, uh, mean radiant temperature of 22 degrees centigrade. Right, but, but you can have the same operative temperature if you can lower the mean radiant temperature, which means if you can lower the temperature of the surfaces in the space, either through a technology like radiant cooling or something, or by increasing the thermal mass of the walls and the building in general, then you can have the, or if you can take it to 18, uh, if you can take the mean radiant temperature to 18, you can increase the dry bulb temperature to 20 to experience the same comfort. So this is what uh, radiant cooling and later, uh, I'll call this back um, when we talk about more about structure cooling. Uh, but I wanted you to keep in mind that what we experience as occupants of a space is not just a function of dry bulb temperature, but a function of surface temperatures as well as dry bulb temperature. And of course the humidity part also, but I'm just talking about the temperatures part here. So with this, uh, let's dive into how exactly radiant cooling works. As I mentioned, uh, cooling to me is primarily uh, something, I mean, uh, taking the heat away, right? And heat, heat, taking the heat away, we have multiple means. In radiant cooling, the way we do it is, we convert one of the civil elements. It could be floor, could be ceiling, could be walls, could be anything, right? There are, there are projects in which we have put radiant panels in the furniture itself, 
the, the, the workstations. So anything that is a heat sink with a large enough surface area, right, will take away the heat from the space. Okay. So a typical installation would be to embed pipes in the floor and uh, you supply chilled water and this entire floor acts as a heat exchanger and takes the heat away. Uh, all these heat sources that you see, human occupant, the lighting, equipment, all can radiate heat to this heat sink. And that's how the heat is taken away. The same thing can be done by having the heat sink on the ceiling. Um, people sometimes ask as to which is more efficient, which one should we go for? Um, I would say that the cooled ceiling is of course more efficient because you get the benefit of uh, convective heat transfer also or higher convective heat transfer here. However, we would, I would normally suggest going with the floor as it is easier to install uh, in ceiling. You have a lot of services running, coordination is difficult. So, uh, and the end, at the end of it, the surface area that you may end up getting even though per square meter you may get higher output, the actual amount of square feet that you get uh, on the ceiling may be lower. So net net, the absolute amount of heat exchange that you would actually get from ceiling and floor may be the same. Okay. And it's much easier to manage a, a floor-based uh, cooling system. However, we have done all, I'll show some of the installations that have been done so that uh, you can visualize it. Um, I want to explain the radiant cooling in, in a way that all of you uh, are familiar with. So that is why I usually add the slide. So this is something we are all aware of, right? Uh, a chiller produces chilled water. Now chilled water goes into the uh, heat exchange in the AHU and uh, we have air, hot air coming back, return air at maybe 26. The heat transfer happens in like a less than a second here in the heat exchanger here where 26 degrees air becomes maybe 14 degrees, maybe 16 degrees air, and then it is pumped through it. One thing we need to uh, appreciate here is that radiant cooling is a low side technology. So if you ask what is the COP of the radiant cooling, it has no COP. What it is doing in essence is replacing HU and ducting. It is not replacing the chiller. It still needs that, but it is primarily replacing that. So it's a low side technology or a cooling distribution technology, not a cooling generation technology. Okay. So how that is today, you are distributing the cooling by having the heat exchange here in this dense heat exchange. But imagine if I were to take this heat exchanger out of that HU in the HU room and put it on the ceiling on each of areas where which you are cooling, then what happens? Then you know, don't need the ducting, you don't need the fan, and you are not constrained by the time uh, that it takes for that heat exchange. So you will have more surface area. So if you if you look at this equation, the heat transfer, total heat transfer is heat transfer coefficient into surface area multiplied by delta or LMTD, whichever, right? Here you will see uh, LMTD will be large. And that is the reason why you need seven degrees centigrade chilled water to maintain 24 degrees centigrade. But if you increase the surface area, your LMTD can come down for the same amount of heat transfer. So therefore, in radiant heat trans, uh, radiant cooling, you can supply water at 15 degrees or 16 degrees and still maintain 24 degrees centigrade. Okay? Because we are having, so per square meter of the heat exchanger, we will get less output now because we are not doing dense heat exchange. But since we have increased the surface area, the absolute amount of heat exchange remains the same. Okay. So that would be a simple way to understand how we are doing. We are essentially 
moving the heat exchange from the HU room into the space itself. Okay. And the efficiency usually comes because um, if you see water is a dense carrier of energy. Okay. Uh, this much amount of water uh, carries the same amount of energy or has the each same heat capacity as uh, these two bags of air, if somebody is more inclined, specifically if you see one, uh, uh, the specific heat capacity of air is only one fourth the specific heat capacity of water. And also in terms of volume for one cubic meter, it is, uh, there's a huge difference in the density. And therefore, the trans energy required to transport uh, the same amount of cooling is much different because you would need ducts of two feet by four feet or two feet by four feet, two feet to transport the volume that is required to do a certain amount of heat transfer. Whereas in case of radiant cooling, you only need 16 mm pipes or therefore the amount of energy that is required would be much lower. And I'll quickly jump to show that uh, this is from one of the projects that was executed just to demonstrate this. The cooling output of HU, so this is in the same space, both are operating. Radiant cooling is operating as well as HU is operating. Both are nearly delivering the same amount of cooling. So this would be roughly about maybe what 11 tons, uh, if I convert kilowatt to tons. So for about 11 or 11.5 11 tons, the HU fan motor is consuming nearly about seven kilowatt of uh, electricity. But to distribute, to deliver the same amount of cooling, the pump that is being used consumes only 0.41 kilowatt of electricity. So that is the amount of difference that it brings in the, uh, in the difference in the energy that is required for on the low side. But it's not just restricted to the low side, it also has brings benefit on the high side because if you see the temperatures that are required, as I mentioned, in this particular case, uh, we have used slightly higher temperatures, but usually you could say about 15 to 16 degrees centigrade. This is the space temperature that is being maintained. In this case, it's being maintained at, on an average, let's say 26, for which the supply temperature was more around 20 or 21. Okay. So to maintain 24, usually we suggest about 16 degrees centigrade. So when you look at uh, what is the difference in uh, the COP of the chiller, because now you are supplying 16 degrees centigrade instead of uh, say 7 degrees centigrade, there's at least about 20 to 25% difference uh, in that. So combined with this and the fan motor uh, energy savings that you get, you could safely say that you could get about 30% savings, uh, you know, 5% here and there uh, with radiant cooling. So apart from the energy saving and uh, savings, there are a couple of other advantages that I want to talk about. Um, one is you can design the spaces to for better indoor air quality. Uh, there are many projects uh, that we have done, others have done in the country where uh, air recirculation can be completely avoided uh, when you are doing buildings with radiant cooling. The reason is if primarily the sensible cooling can be con completely handled by radiant cooling, let's say if you are building envelope is good, uh, and just a rule of thumb, maybe if your building total heat load is somewhere around 300 to 350 square feet per ton, then you could look at radiant cooling handling the complete sensible load. But if you are at around 250 SFT per ton or so, uh, then some amount of sensible load needs to be handled by age. Uh, but let's say, let's talk about the situation where you have around 350 SFT per ton. Uh, radiant cooling handles entire sensible load. So remaining latent and fresh air load needs to be handled by uh, a TFA or 
in in the radiant cooling parlance it is called dos dedicated outdoor air system so when you use that you can have just once through air and when you have once through air your chances of uh, infection or recirculation of some of the biocontaminants uh, can be significantly avoided the second aspect is the uh, uniform comfort in the space so all of us know that uh, when we use uh, air conditioning there are pockets where if somebody is you know sitting closer to uh, you know uh, a grill or a vent where air is coming supplier is there and somebody who's not closer so there is a difference and sometimes you get hit by if the design is improper you can get hit by the direct cold breeze right uh, but that is not there because in radiant cooling you have the entire heat exchanger is spread over the space and uh, such uh, hot uncomfortable pockets are more or less eliminated so uh, you have better quality of uh, cooling one of the things that we don't appreciate here as much uh, but i have seen quite a bit of it in europe where the 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 noise of the air delivery is actually a pollutant okay. and many people people uh, prefer not to have that noise so uh, in systems that are designed with radiant cooling we can avoid such things uh, quickly there are different ways it can be done uh, i'll show you each of example for each of them uh, slab cooling is what most people used to do in the early years of radiant cooling um where the pipes are embedded in the slab while during the construction um the other is floor cooling which is what we have been pushing most of the time uh ease of multiple reasons um ceiling based cooling where we can plaster the pipes on the ceiling uh, you can use radiant panels now we are also using baffles in some projects i'll just quickly show i'll just skip then show as to in different projects what have been used uh, this is a project in jaipur where radiant heating as well as cooling is there it's primarily floor based cooling or heating uh, aided by uh, relatively smaller size no hu was not used so fan coil units uh, were used for the fresh air as well as the balanced sensible cooling this is a project in uh, this is an exhibition space in delhi heart in chennai where uh, one of the requirements was uh, to keep the space very clean and not uh, have ducts visible so the the sizing of the ducts was to be reduced and uh, radiant cooling was used to reduce that sizes the ducts were still used uh, they are i mean under the floor and the air delivery is from the sides so radiant cooling helped uh, achieve better comfort and also better aesthetics in this particular project uh, this is a project in which uh, this was done almost 10 years ago and uh, this is about 2 lakh square feet but uses only 200 tons because along with radiant cooling uh, thermal storage was used um, and also um heat recovery was used so from six initial design of 16 air handling units this was brought down to just four uh, treated fresh air units with heat recovery so this is one of the highly efficient uh, buildings that we have uh, executed um this is a retrofit that we had done a retrofit where the piping was done on the ceiling this is the ceiling part and then was plastered completely plastered um, so the heat exchanger was on the ceiling this is the ceiling cooling that i was talking about and then there is floor cooling also that was done uh, in the the pipes were embedded in the screed and this is these this is the final look and feel of course uh, fan coil units were used for delivering the fresh air treated fresh air into the space um sometimes uh, we get asked that uh, what about the condensation so uh, this is a project that is a proof that if your building if your building envelope is tight enough it doesn't matter this is in chennai this place is hardly a kilometer from 
the seashore and uh, in last six seven years or so uh, never had any condensation it does not matter whether it is chennai delhi nagpur as long as your building envelope has leakages infiltration uh, during the monsoons or periods of high humidity you may have a chance uh, if things not taken care of but in general uh, wherever the buildings are tight enough infiltration is not that much it's not it's taken care of you don't have that risk okay. uh, this is another project just to demonstrate that uh, this is a small 10000 square feet you know uh, 10 lakh square feet space just to show that it has been implemented in a multi tenant building also this is uh, an installation uh, the first and maybe the only kind of install uh, uh, warehouse where which is being cooled by radiant panels so you will see panels on the ceiling and also on the walls um, this uh, these panels were specially designed to uh, reduce the heat ingress and the initial load of 130 tons was reduced to 78 tons uh, we mean uh, so the requirement in this space is 22 plus or minus one uh, with 50 percent rh 365 days 24 7. this is another shop floor with panels on the top uh, these are radiant cooling baffles that uh, uh, now are finding favor in many projects uh, we are finding uh, we're going to install in a few projects now in bangalore or in Patna, places like this uh, a lot of traction is there now we are seeing even in heating this is uh, an aircraft hangar in srinagar where uh, since it would be difficult to heat a hangar with air conditioning because the the door um, opening and closing frequently uh, therefore radiant floor heating was thought of an appropriate solution uh, another project in uh, ladakh very close to pangong lake was uh, this is a completely off-grid building and there's no electricity uh, diesel is primarily used there for heating to operate the boilers so radiant uh, heating along with solar thermal solar photovoltaic and geothermal was used to reduce the energy consumption uh, or consumption of uh, diesel here so maybe i'll pause here for some time and uh, uh, maybe respond to the questions So the first question is, what is the maximum heat rate that is how much watts per square meter heat load radiant cooling can take? Can it meet for a server hall having 200 watts per square feet? Uh, generally, uh, a floor-based uh, cooling, the maximum that we have seen is 75 watts per square meter. 75 watts per square meter uh, but if you go to ra radiant baffles and all uh, this can be extended to 100 110 comfortably in some case like what one of the warehouses that i had shown we had delivered up to 140 watts per square meter but 200 watts per square feet is not a load that i'm aware any radiant cooling system has taken um, there are other ways to deal with it um in a more energy efficient fashion so uh, mr lohia i'll enter towards the end of the presentation i'll share my contact details uh, we can have a more detailed discussion that. but uh, the answer is uh, radiant cooling definitely cannot handle it this kind of load by itself how do you decide surface temperature to be kept in radiant cooling for op optimum operating temperature um, there are there is there are uh, ashray uh, design handbook uh, has a chapter for entirely for designing which defines uh, what is, should be the pipe size used what should be the distance what should be the flow rate everything and what should be the inlet temperature so i would refer you uh, to uh, ashray handbook 
uh, I think it's chapter number six, which has panel based cooling and hydronic cooling. Uh, you can look that up. Um, but in general, um, the floor temperatures that we see in radiant cooling typically are between 20 to 22 degrees centigrade when we have to maintain around 24 to 26 degrees centigrade. What is the MOC of the embedded pipes and what about the leakages in pipes? Um, I'll, I'll show something and then uh, we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll put this on a hold, I'll answer, let me see. How is air circulation in radiant cooling? Uh, you use regular air products, fair fan coil units, air handling units, TFA, depending on the project, what it is. So uh, you, if it is the property of air, if you need fresh air, then you need an air system. If you need to reduce humidity of the air, then you need an air system. There is no uh, way to get around that. You have to have, uh, just to give, but what happens is, I'll give you an example of, say, one of the first projects that was there. Uh, it's about very close to where I'm sitting, Infosys building, where they built two buildings right next to each other. So the one with... Uh, air handling unit, by the way, I mean, both buildings were very efficient. Uh, they were around 550 square feet per ton. So for such a building, there were six air handling units with 120,000 CFM from what I remember. And the other, the one with radiant uh, had uh, only TFA, which was uh, 19,000 CFM. So it is required, but uh, not the quantity is greatly reduced depending on how good your design is. Any specific care in PCC or the tiles? Uh, no, we've not had any, I mean, just the way usually you would put. Uh, one of the things that I'll definitely say uh, is the biggest risk that I see is one should insist on zero level before you start doing any work on the about the radiant pool. Uh, what I've observed is uh, many times the final leveling usually is done by the tile person or whoever is doing it. And they use the screed depending on the final, I mean, when they do it. But if you try to do that in radiant where you have uneven flow, then, uh, and if you don't even it out, then the amount of screed uh, that you will find uh, the radium pipes embedded in will be more in one place, less in another place. So your output will vary. You have to remember what you are doing. Many people look at this as though it's some kind of a plumbing or a labor job. It is not. It is actually you are manufacturing a heat exchanger in situ. So you need to know what how this heat exchanger works. Our HVAC industry, we are used to having heat exchanges tested at a factory, do a QA test, see if it is delivering the required this thing. We don't have that luxury when we are doing radiant cooling. The heat exchanger is manufactured in situ. So you have to be careful. You have to be aware of what you're doing and uh, be willing to stop if you know things are not being done the way they are because that impacts the output. So apart from that, no major this thing, we also have to ensure that there are no air gaps when they are putting the uh, tiles, uh, because then that acts as an insulator. Uh, there shouldn't be any air gaps. Uh, that is the second thing you need to keep in mind. Uh, it's a basic question, how can we avoid condensation? How do we balance the dew point temperature? Can I kindly share the trip. Uh, see, uh, the first thing about condensation you need to understand is condensation happens only when a surface temperature is lower than the dew point of the air at that place. Um, uh, the condensation, so let me give you an example. If you, if you uh, have a space which has 24 degrees centigrade, 50% RH, the dew point of that condition of air is 13.5 degrees centigrade. So unless your floor is lower than 35 or equal to 13.5 degrees centigrade, which it can never be if you are supplying 16 degrees centigrade air, you will not have condensation. 
So in what condense in in what scenario will you have condensation? The scenario in which you will have condensation, and this is something we tell all operators as a standard operating procedure, is uh, this would be a typical scenario. Let's say the system was off completely on Saturday and Sunday, and on Monday the facilities team comes and starts radiant cooling first. Uh, whereas over the weekend there has been a lot of infiltration or you know humidity has accumulated. Now you have air which is not dehumidified and may have, may have, especially in monsoon, dew point higher than let's say 20 degrees centigrade. In that condition, you may have. So as a standard operating procedure, what we tell is whenever you're starting a system after a significant break, first run the air system, dehumidify the air, ensure that the space temperature is or temperature and the dew point is lower uh, and then start the radiant cooling. So maybe start the HU half an hour before you start the radiant cooling. But all this is handled if there's a large project in most projects there are controls, there are flow, uh, floor sensors to measure the floor temperature, there are dew point temperatures and then which are connected to walls which stop or modulate depending on whether the surface temperature is uh, lower, I mean, lower than or closer to the dew point of the air. So in general, controls take care of it, but we should also take care of it in terms of our how we operate the system. How can we calculate water flow rate for radiant baffle spooling? Uh, water flow rate is the same way you can calculate for any tonnage, right? If you are, you have, assume that it's a heat exchanger. Assume that you are doing it for a, a coil, cooling coil, right? If you have a number of baffles and they are delivering, you know, one ton. So you will do depending on uh, whatever is the delta you take. In baffles, usually we take three degree delta. So let's say at a five degree delta, usually you get about 2.4 GSGPM per ton or 2.6. Um, so in this case, this will increase. So multiply that by five by three. So you may get it somewhere around maybe 3.5 US GPM. But uh, the delta we usually design the baffles for is three degrees centigrade because we don't have the luxury of thermal mass. And we want to keep the baffles uh, surface temperature more or less uniform. So the flow rate will increase a bit. You can design it for five degree delta. Generally, I wouldn't recommend it. What about the time lag? If the space uh, required immediately cooling, is it suitable for use? So this also, I'll keep it in hold. I'll show you something and answer along with the earlier question. How can we design or select size of pipe in radiant baffles? Uh, you do not generally choose the pipe that goes into the baffles. Typically, you work with whatever is the pipe size that the manufacturer provides. So somebody like us or some other suppliers, you see what their models are, what is the pipe size, and then you design your flow as per that. Okay. So let me quickly go to answer the two questions that I didn't answer. Okay. So I'll skip a few good number of sides first and uh, to get to what I want to show. So I'll just escape this first so somebody asked what is the material right uh, material uh, there are two popular materials that are used pert 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 pipes and pex pipe pex pex pipes and the ones that we use are usually a five layer pipe with an oxygen diffusion barrier you get pex and pert without oxygen diffusion barrier those are typically used for uh, plumbing but since these are embedded in the building structure, you, what we recommend is, and what is recommended by the standards is also to have an oxygen diffusion barrier so that oxygen doesn't diffuse. Uh, the life of these pipes is more than 100 years. Um, I can show that. We generally suggest PERT, but no particular, uh, you know, love for PERT, except that PERT is recyclable, PEX is not. So that's all the reason why we usually suggest PERT, but there are projects which are using both kind of pipes. It doesn't matter. It's like saying that uh, 
copper from company A is better than copper from company B. Doesn't matter. It's just a pipe. It's like a pipe in a heat exchanger. When you buy, uh, let's say, an AHU or an air conditioner, do you go and check whose pipe, copper pipe, is put there? No. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, what really matters is, uh, do you have a competent team to execute this job, who understand and will not allow, uh, as I said, uh, this is basically manufacturing heat, ex heat exchanger in situ. So if somebody views this as a work that is like a labor-oriented work, you just have to lie, lay the pipe and not worry about other things that need to be taken care of during installation, then you are in trouble. So if you can see, these pipes are used even in road snow melt. This is, of course, in Germany. Uh, there is hot asphalt being poured, there's a road roller going. There are highways with these pipes. Okay, So where a 40-ton truck may go. So in terms of the durability of pipe, there is never a question. Uh, however, you cannot vouch for if the workmanship is bad, uh, there are people who do not take care of it. Yes, it's, it's a plastic pipe. I mean, it will get, if somebody drills a hole, it will get, the hole will get drilled. So uh, on its own, it can, once embedded, it will not get deteriorated, it will not get spoiled, live for more than 100 years, more than life of the building. Uh, not an issue. The second question uh, that I didn't answer was about the time it takes because there is enough thermal mass, right? So I'll show that again with maybe some data I have. Let me see if I have that data. I hope I had that. Oh, yeah. So this is from uh, a project that we had done where we had compared that. Uh, so what you see here, so if you see the top one, so there are two, uh, blocks that were compared, a block called John Bardeen, which was done with radiant cooling, and a block called Abdul Kalam, which had a conventional air handling unit. So this is the temperature profile over two, three days of this room, which is with age. The red color is the space temperature profile of the space which was done with radiant. This is the supply temperature to the radiant system. This is the supply temperature to the air handling unit. Okay. Now, what you will observe, and this is one thing that we really need to understand how radiant cooling systems work. What you're saying is right. It is not an instantaneous on and off. But it also means that if you have heated or cooled a thermal mass, it will remain in that state for a longer period. Not just that, if I cool the floor, it's not just that the floor will be cold. Floor is exposed to the ceiling. So if floor is 22, the ceiling at some point will become 23. The walls will also become 23, 24. The table, chair, every thermal mass that is there because the floor doesn't know what to cool, what not to cool. The only criteria it has is if it is hotter than 22 degrees centigrade, then there will be a heat transfer from that surface to this surface. That's all it happens. Whether it is a human, light, uh, glass, ceiling, table, chair, nothing. So what happens once you see the steady state is that all the thermal masses in that space are generally lowered. And this is what I call lower mean radiant temperature. Now, once all the thermal masses are cooler, what happens if you observe here what is happening? Roughly at seven o'clock, this is an IT company. Uh, the chiller is switched off. The you know office closes. So the this is there's a dedicated chiller for radiant. So you will see the chiller is switched off, and then uh, the same thing. AHU is fan motor is switched off. So you will see an immediate spike in the temperature of that space. The reason is, even if there is no occupancy, there is load. This is April in Hyderabad. The ambient temperature is still higher. So there will be transmission gains. And this space has uh, floor to ceiling glass all around. So there will be heat ingress through, those, through that glazing and of course through the walls. So you will see that heat is still coming in and uh, the temperature increases. Whereas here also, it's the same amount of heat that comes, 
but it does not increase the space temperature. This goes on and is absorbed by the thermal masses, which are colder. And therefore, by next day, when you come, the temperature is still below 25 degrees centigrade. Unlike this, where you have to take, because you kept on allowing the heat to come in in both cases, but here it started increasing the air temperature. It takes about two hours to bring this temperature down to 25, whereas here it is already 25. So thermal mass, while being a disadvantage when you first start it, can be can work as a thermal storage, which reduces your. I mean, it can. The entire reason we use thermal storage is it can also give advantage of less cut-ins and cut-off, and you know, as uh, some amount of energy stored that can be given during uh, other places reduces your peak load capacity, peak loads, uh, energy consumption as well. So with that, I hope I have answered all the questions. I see there was some, one more. What if the pipe gets damaged? Can we fix it? Yes, you can. I don't know what's the time. Okay. I'll just quickly show uh, maybe uh, two videos that will help in understanding uh, how this is done. So let me go back to where we were. So uh, this is one of our first projects um, where you can see that this was installed in slab. Uh, so there's PD slab, the wire mesh laid, and the pipes are laid in the slab. Uh, slab is poor. This you will see that, I mean, during the night when we were not there, some labor walked there and there was a uh, issue. So uh, we use a secure compression joint to join this. There are joints. So one thing you need to understand is uh, what the material that we are using, Europe has been using this for nearly four decades. I mean, they've been using it for heating. We get the same material, circulate cold water in it, and we call it radiant cooling. But otherwise, all these accessories, these tools, these products have been in the market for nearly four decades now. So all these issues have been uh, encountered and uh, workable solutions have been found for this. So usually we don't, but unless, uh, you know, uh, if it's required, we do this. Okay. Um, so one second. So while we are here, I'll just quickly show uh, maybe a couple of uh, other videos also. Um, maybe helpful. This is the project uh, for which I had shown some data. Uh, this is the project where we had done it on the ceiling. Um, the entire pipes were put on the ceiling, then pressure tested when everything is okay. We plastered it, connected it to the manifolds. Then uh, another block where uh, insulation was put and then pipes were installed. Uh, again, pressure test. Uh, connected to the manifold. If everything is okay, you lay the screed and then the tiles. And uh, this is the final space, which was that. So slab cooling, ceiling cooling, floor cooling. And uh, this is the warehouse where radiant panels are installed. So of course, there is there is uh, air system to maintain humidity. As I mentioned, this space requires to be 24-7, 365 days, needs to be maintained at uh, 22 plus or minus one because this is a uh, finished goods warehouse for a pharma company. There are US FDA approved audits that are happening every quarter to see that there's no temperature variation across so that was the other reason why they chose to have radiant cooling apart from the energy savings because it allowed them to have uniform uh, temperature of course. So with that, let's uh, jump to structure cooling. Hopefully, 
one second. I'll just have some water. I've been talking for too long. So structure pooling is uh, is a variant of uh, uh, radiant cooling. Uh, this is not something that was started by us. I had seen this first uh, done by many of you might be aware of uh, Mr. R.S. Kulkarni. Uh, I had seen him do it and then uh, we have also done some. Um, I find it very useful. This is not something that is uh, done anywhere else uh, in the world. I think only in India you will find uh, structure pooling. Uh, and the reason for that is, and the reason I think we should adopt this is because India will be the country that will consume the most amount of energy for cooling in next 15, 20 years. We will beat China, we will beat US, because you have to understand all the uh, developed, so-called developed countries, if you look at it, Western Europe or Northern America, they're above the Tropic of Cancer which means their heat loads are less, right? Whereas we are saying, we, we install one ton for 150 to 250 tons, uh, square feet per ton, right? Whereas the same thing in Paris or in Munich or in New York, maybe more around 500 or 600 SFT per ton because their heat loads are lower. Now it may be changing with London touching 40 degrees and all, but in general, that is, our heat load, so our cooling requirement per square foot hours is higher and we require it for more number of hours in a year than compared to all these economies. Therefore, for the same one ton air conditioner in India will cool less space and will run for more number of hours and therefore cumulatively it will use more energy. Now, Therefore, we need to find a way to cool ourselves. This, if all of us, all Indians, like Modi ji said, if 25 years become developed country and all of us want the same cooling comfort like what is enjoyed by Western Europe or Northern America today, there are not enough resources for all of us to experience that. So we need to find ways and maybe also change definition of what is cooling. Okay, So... To answer this, we have to look at cooling. We have to go back to some basics and understand why is that we actually need cooling. We need cooling because we are allowing the heat in, right? In your heat load calculation, if you see the highest amount of uh, the highest proportion will be not from the internal heat loads, not from the occupancy loads, not from the lighting loads, but more from the direct solar gains, you know, through solar radiation, either through the walls or through the glass and transmission gains. So these are coming through the building structure, passing through that and coming inside. What if, and then what we are doing today, we are then removing this heat using energy guzzling equipment like air conditioner. We, we allow it to come inside. And uh, you can see this, very well in many buildings in Gurgaon, right? All glass, of course, some of them have uh, better glass, but still you allow so much heat inside that you don't need and then use energy guzzling equipment to remove it. So what we are saying is if he can remove this heat from the structure itself before it comes inside, okay? And so we did some study to see. So on the right, you will see the, uh, thermograph um, where uh, the temperature is 40 degrees centigrade even in the night okay, when ambient temperature is lower. This is because the thermal mass of the building has been absorbing all the heat. Sun comes up, dumps the heat, goes away. Where does that heat go? Into the building thermal mass. right? And that is radiated to you even when the sun is not. So, uh, so if you are able to flush that heat somehow then our buildings will be cooler and therefore we will be cooler in those buildings. This is the same effect of, in some ways you could say, of having thicker walls like we used to have in the older buildings. 
which didn't allow the inner walls to become hot. Now we don't have that luxury because it costs too much to build a three feet wall. So we might, we will have to use some other alternative means, which is what is structure cooling. So what we do is we embed network of pipes in the structure, just like radiant cooling. But instead of using a chiller, we use a low energy system like a multi-stage cooling tower here. We have used cooling tower, multi-stage cooling tower, or some other sort of heat sink that I'll talk about in the next session, uh, next section, actually. So uh, if you have seen here, uh, I'll just show a few thermographs. These are the temperatures that are taken um, of a space in summer. You will see the ceiling temperature. This is in the night, by the way, around 9.30 or so. Uh, that is 40 degrees centigrade, 41 nearly. West wall is 37. Floor, which is not even exposed to the solar radiation or even outside temperature is also 36. And the reason why it is, is your building is one continuous thermal mass, right? The wall gets heated, it will conduct heat to the floor, right? Whereas in winter, in the afternoon, the same surfaces are at lower temperature. So what, if you are able to, and we are comfortable with just fan and maybe even natural ventilation in this, when it is in this condition. So if you are able to flush the heat and bring these surfaces closer to these temperatures, then we will experience comfort without requiring air conditioning. So that's the premise, right? So how do we do that to remove 40 degrees heat or 37 degrees heat or 36 degrees heat? We don't need seven degrees centigrade temperature. If you have 24, 25 degrees, 26 degrees centigrade water available, then we can flush it out. And that is why we use something like a cooling tower. In this case, a two-stage cooling tower. I'll explain that in a bit because we can get better temperatures. Okay. So the idea is to simply just keep flushing the heat. Uh, a two-stage cooling tower allows you to have, just like an IDEC, which allows you to indirect, direct uh, evaporative uh, cooling issue where you try to get lower temperatures. In, you apply the same principle to cooling tower and get lower temperature uh, water, which will enhance your output. Okay. So where is, where is this needed? I believe that there is a whole host of infrastructure in the country where we need to provide comfort if we have to call ourselves a developed country or we have to, we have to aspire. To. You can't have Airports without fully air conditioned, international schools which are fully air conditioned, but you will have government school without, with some old fan running where the students are suffering when it is 40 degrees, 45 degrees. Can't have an ISBT where you just leave people to whatever heat it is there, right? I'm not saying, I mean, these are all buildings where it is difficult to provide air conditioning anyway because there's so much footfall, traffic, that if you try to air condition it, you have to close everything. And that may not be possible. So, and there are a whole host of buildings like primary health centers, a whole host of government buildings where only the officer will have one split AC or one window AC. All others are just working in the heat. So we can't call ourselves a developed country if we allow a section of the population to, you know, enjoy cooling, but others will not, you know, will suffer. So I believe Technologies like this where you can provide cooling simply by flushing the heat out where you are using only a pump and a cooling tower reduces energy consumption by more than 90%. Of course, it will not give the same temperature. Uh, you cannot expect the same temperature as air conditioning, but you can expect somewhere between 26 to 30 degrees centigrade with fan and natural ventilation, which is... Uh, that is crime coming inside the building. So your chiller plant can reduce. A few, few examples of uh, 
such installation. This is, uh, these are uh, hostels in I am Raipur, where uh, since it's a government hostel, you can't give air conditioning. Uh, same are being done even in IIT Hyderabad, where uh, water at uh, higher than the dew point uh, temperature, uh, which is, or actually the ambient dew point, which is much higher, uh, is circulated just to flush out the heat. No RH control. You can keep the windows open. Fans can run uh, just so that the building uh, heat is flushed out. Uh, similarly, this is uh, an architecture college at VIT in Velour in Tamil Nadu, where uh, it's run with cooling tower in this case. There is um, a small um, commercial building in Chennai where they hybridized it. This is, uh, this is 6,000 square feet. Normally, one would put about 40 tons of split AC in this building. Um, so only 13 tons of split AC was put along with uh, structure cooling and so that uh, split AC is used only when it is needed. Uh, this is another project. Uh, this was one of, this was the first project that you used, used this. This is in Pune in uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology where uh, a two-stage cooling tower was used to lower the, get a lower temperature water. So that is about the, uh, structure pooling. If there are questions, let me see if I can answer. What about verification and validation of piping net in the floor or in ceiling? Um, I'm not sure I understand uh, what verification, uh, but if you're talking about the output, uh, so there are, from what I understand, you may mean two kinds of verification, whether there is a leak or not. Uh, because we keep it pressurized, if there is a leak, we would know because there will be a drop in pressure. And that is how we would come to know that there is um, a leak. But if you're talking about the output, then yes, it needs to be tested. And uh, this is where uh, the commissioning skills come into the picture. As I said, the heat exchanger is manufactured in situ. Uh, you assume certain uh, thermal conductivity of the screed because of difference in the mix of cement, sand, whatever it may be, something else. So you have to fine tune that with maybe flow rate or a different, slightly different temperature. So needs to be done. So commissioning is critical in this. What is the maximum delta T we can achieve? So I presume this is related to structure cooling. Uh, it will, of course, Structure cooling is not as straightforward as uh, radiant because we don't control the temperature of the uh, supply temperature because it's dependent on ambient, I mean, the temperature and humidity conditions. So uh, would be difficult to commit, but in general, you can, for the most part, I would say 80 to 90% of the time, you can assume for most parts of India, you can achieve between 26 to 30 degrees centigrade okay with with a multi-stage cooling tower not with a regular cooling tower. please explain double effect cooling tower okay i'll go back to that and explain again what will be the implication of ambient temperature especially when ambient is high uh, even if the ambient is high so let me go to that uh, slide so that i can explain this Yeah. So let's say if you take uh, a situation where it is 40 degrees centigrade, 13% RH, extremely dry, right? Uh, may not be that usually 40 degrees centigrade, we get 20%. But let's, if you go along with this, right, with me on this, uh, this is just for, uh, you know, explaining this. So the, the, the uh, wet bulb temperature of this I think would be 22 degrees or maybe 20 degrees centigrade. So 20 degrees centigrade. For this, the wet bulb may be 20 degrees centigrade. Um, actually, I may, one second, I'll, I'll, let's actually check it. So if I do, uh, 
So if you do that, so, so let's say we do it for Delhi, uh, Delhi elevation, maybe around, I don't know, maybe around 500 meters, 600, I don't know. RH, let's say 13.9 or whatever was there. And uh, uh, RH elevation, dry bulb temperature, let's say 40 degrees centigrade, right? Uh, so you will see that the weld bulb is nearly 20 degrees centigrade for it, right? So let's come back to this. Um, so, so what would happen in your regular cooling tower is uh, you would achieve wet bulb plus two, plus four, whatever, depends on you know the kind of cooling tower you offered. There are cooling towers which can give wet bulb plus 1.1 or 1.5. So let's assume you have a cooling tower, the regular cooling tower, which gives wet bulb plus four. So you will achieve 24 degrees centigrade, right? This is what you get. But let's say I increase the capacity of the cooling tower a little bit, and some of that water I circulate in a heat exchanger before the air comes into the cooling tower. So what happens is you will then follow this path first, right? The air will get cooled its uh, absolute humidity is not changing because it's indirect cooling, right? It's sensible cooling. And now we'll get cooled by, let's say if initially it is getting 24 degrees centigrade, we can get air now at 30 degrees centigrade. Now this has a different, its RH has increased, but its wet bulb is now lower. Its wet bulb may be around 17 degrees or 16 degrees, something like that, maybe lower. Right now, you once it this air goes inside the cooling tower, it will deliver lower temperature water because its wet bulb is lower now because you have changed the psychrometrics of the air. Now you can do it in multi stage. There are other ways it can do. So basically, this is this is just a two step. You can play around with it and do much better and get lower temperatures. So I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, what will be the implication of the ambient temperature, especially when it is high? Obviously, you know, everything will depend on ambient temperature and RH. And from the cytometry, you can find out uh, what widths that you will get. There is enough data available. You can run through simulation and see uh, for what period. Uh, so, of course, so just think, let's say if we had a situation where it was 35 degrees, and let's say 60 or 70 percent RH. You know, this would be the condition of Delhi in July, August, something like that, right? Uh, 35 degrees, 60 percent RH. So, in that case, if you see there's not enough available, even if I were to do it, the difference between the original wet bulb and this will not be much, and you will achieve maybe only 27, 28 at best, right? So, yes, it has an impact. And uh, uh, the key is to make do with what you have to reduce uh, this. Uh, but as I said, again, uh, this is uh, primarily for areas that uh, otherwise would not have any cooling system. When we send the water through the cooling tower, quality of water will be affected. No, the regular, uh, you know, uh, maintenance thing that you need to do, quality of water needs to be maintained. Of course, frequent flushing might be required. The cooling tower maintenance will remain the same, will not change. Okay. You need to maintain, manage, uh, follow the regular cooling tower maintenance processes. So with that, let me jump into, it's already what, 5.30. So let me jump into lake pond loop cooling. Now, this lake pond loop cooling has a bit of a background in geothermal cooling. Uh, we are doing India's largest geothermal cooling in Bhuneshwar, and we do get a lot of inquiries related to geothermal cooling. 
Now, I am not against geothermal cooling, but we have to understand the context. So, let me place the context why geothermal cooling may not be the best choice for India. So, you have to understand few things. One is when uh, in, in one is first thing that I already mentioned is our heat loads are higher, which means for the same square footage, for the same, let's say, 2 lakh square footage, in India, we will require more number of bores because I have more tonnage, right? So the project viabilities are different, right? So I need at least double the number of bores in India, in Delhi or in Nagpur, or in Hyderabad, when compared to, let's say, Paris or New York or Minnesota, right? So that increases the cost as it is. Second is our soil temperatures are much higher than Western Europe or Northern America. Generally, if you see uh, the rule of thumb there is, it says, that whatever is the average ambient temperature of the space of that location, let's say Delhi, that would be the, uh, the normal ground temperature uniform throughout the year. Okay. So obviously Delhi's average ambient temperature, annual average temperature is higher than Paris, higher than Munich. So therefore your ability to reject heat to the ground because whether you're in Paris or whether you're in Delhi, your condenser water uh, outlet temperature will be 35 degrees or 32 degrees, right? That doesn't change. But your output of the geothermal bore will depend on what is the, among other things, definitely will depend on the temperature of the soil. If the average temperature of the soil in Paris is 15 degrees and average temperature of soil in Delhi is 27 degrees centigrade, then the same length of bore will give more output in Paris than in Delhi. Therefore, you need to dig deeper. deeper. So if in, in, Western, in Paris, let's say you are happy with 50 meters or a 40 meter bore in Delhi to get the same output, you need to go for 100 or 120 meter bore, which again increases your cost, right? Lastly, Though in theory, earth is an infinite sink, it cannot take continuously dumping the heat. In India, most places have only cooling requirement, whereas in West, it is both heating and cooling. So you see what happens in West is one season you will dump the heat. In summer, you are going on dumping the heat and that heat is accumulating and increasing the temperature of the surface. Uh, soil and by the time summer is over and winter comes you're extracting the same heat you get better performance again in winter because you are trying to get heat from the ground so the cycling of the soil happens and energy balance is maintained and therefore these bores can be used for longer periods now imagine the same state in you know we're trying to do it in mumbai or chennai or something where Almost all 12 months you are using cooling. If you go on dumping the heat, at some point there will be localized saturation. Or you have to oversize the system so much that you don't develop that oversized saturation, which again increases the cost. So these are the constraints. It's actually the cost constraint, not the technology constraint. Technically, you can build and make geothermal cooling work in India, no doubt. But to size the geothermal heat exchanger correctly for our operation, your costs are going to be really high. And it becomes economically unviable in some cases. Okay? So just keep that in mind. So because of this, so if you see in this picture that I'm showing, as I said earlier, Cooling to me is a process of taking away the heat. And it's the same thing. Today, we reject heat. Finally, the heat that is coming from indoors to air and call it air cool. We reject it to 
a cooling tower and call it water cooled we reject it to the ground in any of these different ways you know there are different heat exchanger vertical bores horizontal loops or horizontal piping and we call it ground source heat pump or ground as a heat sink or cooler so i want to introduce one which is available to us and very underutilized in india because we have higher loads and we need higher output a pond or a lake loop may be a better not a maybe is definitely a better solution than trying to drill bores and all this the output that a soil can give is far lower than what a heat exchanger same heat exchanger in a water can give but how do we get this water we'll come to that but before that let's see how this works right so essentially what you are doing is you are getting rid of cooling tower and evaporation mechanism and using sensible heating of a large body of water now i understand that large body of water may not be possible everywhere we'll discuss that later but wherever it is feasible okay there is water enough water will come to that uh you can put a uh hdp based heat exchanger basically this is the piping network you would put in the ground in geothermal heat exchanger all i'm saying is put that in water you will get better performance and year on year better performance no degradation no derating alternatively you can use plate heat exchangers like this and be part of a water feature which many projects have right the size of this and the heat rejection ability can be calculated not an issue at all okay but this water body today which is there in many projects can now become a heat sink and uh, can be used for high efficiency chiller instead of going for geothermal okay so i'll show you some projects uh, this is nashville airport in us which is using Uh, a heat exchanger like this in a nearby water body um it depends on what is our imagination and what is allowed uh, this is uh, I'll, i'll show a video of this is a video maybe i can show it of uh, one second all right one second uh this is a this is a installation of such a heat exchanger in phoenix zoo so you will see that uh, heat exchanger which is nothing i mean you can have cooling tower in parallel it doesn't cost much if you think uh, there are going to be risks but this such an installation also doesn't cost much where you are using a water body to reject heat you know there are projects i am not saying this is feasible in, in all projects but it can be uh, done in projects where it is possible right and i'll show you something that we are doing i mean okay even further if you look at it uh, on a larger scale that um, this is uh, toronto actually uses a large lake uh, for providing cooling for its buildings Uh, as a service i mean there is a central station uh, now toronto is a cooler place if you go deep enough into that lake ontario you will get very cold water so it's possible so they use the cooling water directly without any chiller but in our case uh, we can use it in two ways one uh, as a condenser for the chiller to uh, you know have better efficiency and not have to you know have treatment of water and all that uh, other could be we can use this with combine this with structure cooling and use it and that is what we are doing in one of the projects uh, i'll show you so as a first step this is a project a school in delhi that uh, we would be doing this project where we using swimming pool as a heat sink we are not using any uh, refrigeration equipment no compressor based system just a plate heat exchanger and flush the heat out from the building structure so that we don't even need cooling tower maintenance of cooling tower and all that and you get heated pool for free right so 
So you take the heat of the building, dump it in the cooling tower. And cooling, uh, this uh, swimming pool is, sorry, dump it in the swimming pool. And swimming pool will radiate heat out in the night and become cool because it's, it's a large surface. So this is the simplest way we can do. Uh, we hopefully will be able to have this functional by mid next year. Uh, so we're starting with this. There are other projects in which we have, uh, this is another prospective uh, school in Delhi where what we are doing is we're not, we're going one step further and saying we will not even use, we will use a much larger water body. So what is being done here is you uh, take the wastewater, uh, wastewater we separate using a, a, a patented system to separate solids from the water so that it does it, what you get is gray water basically. And solids are composted and given to, you know, they're having urban forestry and vegetable gardens. But this gray water now goes into a small pond or a lake where uh, we are using, um, one second, uh, IIT Bombay's technology here for water remediation. So these are mounds that you will see uh, from which water is uh, goes through. This is these are mounds built with specific layers, specific material, so that water gets uh, cleaned and then you get a treated water, naturally treated water, and this water body then becomes. Uh, so, as I said, not possible in all projects, but wherever it is possible, we're trying to see. Okay, just a little bit more information on what I mentioned earlier. The way that solid water separator works is what you have to understand is black water becomes black water because you allow solid and water to mix. But if you allow, let's say you give a slope to that and when water and solids are coming, you convert that linear momentum into a centrifugal you know, moment, uh, angular momentum, then this works as a centrifuge and will separate solids from water. And this is a technology, I mean, it's been working for four decades. So it's being used in Sweden for, and other parts of the world. Uh, it uh, has all European technical approvals. Very simple, no rotating equipment, nothing. It's just a simple centrifuge that separates solids and water. The Once you separate the water, which is almost of gray water quality, it's much easier for you to treat in something like this and have a water body like this. So a mound here, is where the water will be delivered on top and it will percolate through that and become clean source of water. So these are all things that are possible. Uh, I mean, yes, one can have doubt as to can this be done until it is done. So a lot of projects until they are done, uh, you know, there will always be a doubt, but there are such possibilities. That, and we are designing a few projects with such uh, you know, systems. So that's it from me. I'll see if there are any other questions. Any pond cooling examples in India? Uh, nothing so far. As I mentioned, um, we are in, 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 in right now executing one, which will be ready for you to see, which is more not a pond, but a pool linked one. But maybe in a, in, in a year, we'll have another project where we are able to it's just uh, it takes time for to convince people on such things. All these questions you have to answer, uh, then you have to put. So yeah. Uh, see. So I presume there are no further questions. Uh, so I'll stop. Uh, I hope uh, people who wanted i can put the screen again in case you have not noted my contact if there are questions or things that you want uh, to uh, ask that you could not ask or maybe you know think of it later do drop me an email uh, i had shared my email address there in case you had not noted it is madhu m-a-d-h-u at urja.in o-o-r-j-a.in uh, that's it from me. If there are no further questions, I'll hand it over back to Ashtray Delhi.
So uh, thank you very much, sir. I think it was uh, one of the great session where we have received more than 20 questions, 20, 25 questions. Is, uh, I mean, that's showing that how much uh, uh, participants were involved in your session. And uh, definitely, uh, this is not going to the end. I we will request you again and bother you again for this kind of session in near future as well. And uh, definitely, we'll get request for this uh, uh, session, or we can make a series on this program as well. One session is not enough, but we believe. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we are thankful to you and all the attendees and all the annual partners again uh, for supporting this kind of session with uh, for the Lichap Professor under the banner of Israel headquarter. And uh, uh, there is one request from Delhi chapter of Israel side, one is non-member here. Uh, please support us being a member of Delhi chapter of Israel. There is nothing okay. much to do. I mean, <laughs> uh, you will have to just go through the Israel website. You will find the link of uh, become a member of Israel and you will have to just uh, select Delhi chapter of Israel in, uh, in the membership uh, front. And okay. you will, uh, I mean, uh, there is some details you need to input, uh, and uh, there is a small amount of uh, uh, token amount. You can say there is uh, nothing much, uh, any amount is there, and you will be member of ISRE. There is an option for three years and ten years, so it's up to you that how uh, you are going to become a member. So anyway, uh, I mean uh, this platform provides you the main uh, objective of ISRE is to disseminate knowledge. Uh, in terms of all the aspects of uh, HVAC industry. And uh, definitely we have the great programs, I mean, annual programs, Vancom, Agricom, Cricket, uh, Pharma Fest, and uh, other programs as well, uh, AGM, I mean, for the members when uh, you can get the network uh, in the same industry what you are working with. And definitely uh, uh, this forum, uh, there is no competitor of Israel, what we believe here. and. Uh, Delhi is one of the prominent chapter under the uh, ISRE banner. And definitely you will get embellished in terms of business, in terms of your network, in terms of your knowledge. So again, uh, this is a request. Uh, support us to become a member of Delhi chapter of ISRE. We'll definitely do. Yeah. Definitely do. Yes. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. And thank you everyone who enthusiastically participated and stuck along, even though this was a long session. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the great sessions because uh, so much involvement was there, sir, for the participants. So with the questions and sir, and you have nicely answered all these questions. And definitely, uh, this is one of the great session. It will be uh, this kind of session. We'll happy to repeat again in future as well with you. Sure. There are. I think there are two participants who are raising hands. I don't know Shuja and I don't know. What else. I can't see, but I see. Some messages coming, so I don't so know. Anyway, uh, if you if you allow me, I mean, uh, can uh, allow them to speak in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Because I don't know what. Uh, Suja, if you have any question or any queries, you can ask here. Hello. I think Suja's question was from where to get no temperature of soil below the ground for various locations, how to calculate soil temperature. I think this is one question I didn't answer. So maybe that's why he raised the uh, uh, hand. Uh, there's no way uh, at at a at a at a preliminary stage. What you can do is you can get the uh, data, uh, the all the simulation. Uh, I mean, uh, professionals have it. It is available on online. You can get the DBT data and uh, do an average of annual ab ambient temperature average, and you can assume that uh, as the uh, ground temperature. But in all serious projects, you have to do what is called a TRT test. Um, only a few, one or two companies we have, and maybe another company has. Uh, 
you have to do an actual test at the ground because it all depends on the soil. Uh, we don't know what is the soil strata. If you go for 100 meters, uh, you don't know what kind of soil it is. And uh, depending on the characteristics of the soil at different strata, your output will depend on it. Therefore, a good track at preliminary stage, you can assume that. You can maybe assume a certain thermal conductivity, but uh, do not ever design a geothermal system without doing a soil conductivity test. That has to be done only know what would be the output for, let's say, a 100 meter or 120 meter bore, vertical bore. And then, uh, you know, uh, you can design the number of bores. I hope I answered Shuja's question. Yeah, Mr. Basir Ahmed is also there. With raising hand, uh, Mr. Basir Ahmed, if you have any question, you can ask. Okay. So anyway, I think uh, you may be answered. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then uh, it's almost six, so. With everybody's permission, then let's close the session. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, really, we appreciate yourself uh, you for this great session. And definitely, we'll bother you again for this kind of session in your future. As well. So, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. So, with thank your you. permission, sir, I'm uh, closing this session. All right. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Take care. Okay. Have a good weekend. Enjoy. Bye.